Welcome to the fourth lecture of the course Reinforcement Learning at Paderborn University. My name is Oliver Walschert and today is casino time. We will use so-called Monte Carlo methods trying to transfer the ideas from last week, model-based prediction and control, to their model-free counterparts. Therefore, we will use the following agenda. First, we will discuss briefly the main differences between Monte Carlo methods and dynamic programming from last week. Then we apply Monte Carlo to prediction and control, extend it a little bit in the so-called on policy fashion. So we will use one policy for exploration and exploitation. And then we will split it up in the last two bullet points here in the so-called off policy domain where we have two separate policies. One is uh, more designed for exploration and the second one which is designed for exploitation. As I already very briefly mentioned that Love used dynamic programming and dynamic programming was completely model based. So we were assuming that we have an MDP structure and we have perfect knowledge of the MDP dynamics. And therefore we have called that a planning approach in order to solve prediction control methods. However, as we also discussed last week, this is of course highly um, highly problematic because we cannot assume in uh, each and every situation that we have that perfect knowledge about the MDP and therefore we uh, also have to have a look at methods which are able to operate in unknown. And the first approach to that will be the Monte Carlo methods. There are a big bunch of different algorithms, uh, some of them will be discussed today, which allow us a model-free prediction and control so we don't need to have the uh, pre-knowledge about the internal structure of the MDP. However, we are still uh, assuming that the problem structure we are operating in has MDP4. We don't know the exact specification, but we assume that the internal dynamics of the problem can be described in an MDP form. And our target today, as we already announced, will be again prediction and control. So that means that we want to estimate the value functions and also optimize the policy in this context. So what are the main characteristics of Monte Carlo methods? Very important is that we will learn from experience. So we will sample feedbacks in terms of feedbacks in reward sense and in the state sense. So this will be the feedback of the environment via the interpreter. And of course we, uh, as the agent designer, know what the agent picked for an action. And from these tuples over different uh, steps, we will then try to estimate the value function as well as trying to improve our policy. And the main approach or the main idea of Monte Carlo methods in terms of estimating value functions or then also estimating the performance of a given policy is to use averaging. So we will start, for example, in some state, follow a certain policy, and then we will observe the rewards we will get from that state on and will estimate then the average return in terms of the average state value of that state over different runs, over different trials and just average over these different trials. Therefore, because we are doing that in an episode per episode manner, uh, we will today limit ourselves completely to the episodic task. So we always assume that our task we are interacting with has a natural end and we don't take into, into account any continuing task. So we will also extend the uh, sample-based solutions which we start today with Monte Carlo for episodic tasks and in the next couple of lectures to continuing task. And therefore also as a consequence, uh, very obviously, we can only update our estimates on the state value, action value, as well as the policy updates only in an episode per episode way. So we have to wait until our current episode has terminated, then we can evaluate uh, on the sequence of samples we have received and update. Last week using dynamic programming, we had these one step uh, backups. So we could update our value estimate as well as our policy every step, which I would call like an online type of update. But now with Monte Carlo, we really have to wait until the episode has ended. So with that idea in mind, 
full episode trials and averaging uh, idea of Monte Carlo, we will now apply this to prediction. The recap, what is the uh, prediction statement or the prediction problem statement? So we want to estimate the state value V following a certain policy pi for all states. And as we have mentioned on the previous slide, we will uh, assume that we get feedback samples from the environment plus our actions we apply for different episodes J1 to capital J. And then uh, basically what also were on the uh, two slides before for Monte Carlo prediction solution, we just average the return series being in a certain state, visiting that certain state over all subsequent episodes. So our state value or more particular our estimate, so this hat here is denoting our estimate of the state value is then the averaged sum of all sampled returns and the sampled returns are of course just the discounted rewards being in a certain state and then summing up the discounted rewards until we terminate uh, that certain episode and the termination step here in this today's lecture and also in all the subsequent lectures will be always denoted by a capital T. So TJ would be the termination step of the jth episode. So with this idea, we doing full trials, full episode runs, averaging over the different runs. We can, in the terms of Monte Carlo, distinguish two flavors. The first flavor is the first visit uh, MC. So we only apply that averaging to states the first time when they're visited. So if there's any problem and during one episode we are visiting one state more than one time, so then we only perform that type of update from the viewpoint of the first visit. The so first visit idea and obviously what could be the other flavor that could be then the every visit Monte Carlo update. So we apply 4.1 uh, each time we are visiting a certain state. So if we are visiting a state during one episode 10 times, then we would have 10 updates of that state value with different reward, discounted reward series denoted here. We will discuss the differences of first visit and every visit uh, Monte Carlo approaches also a little bit later. But first let's discuss or let's have a little bit uh, deeper view how that first visit Monte Carlo could be implemented in pseudocode. So if we want to do Monte Carlo based prediction in that first visit flavor. What uh, we are going to input of course is our policy pi which is going to be evaluated. We will get an output in terms of the estimates of all uh, state values in our state space and we need some initialization. So one initialization of course is we need uh, some arbitrary starting points for our state values. So if a specific state is terminal then we should also initialize that specific state value as zero and also um, putting zero for all other state values is a pretty default initial guess. And we will need a list. So this small L here will be an empty list for every state, uh, which we will then use in order to average our sampled returns. And then what's happening? So we will roll out one to J uh, different episodes and we will in every episode generate an ep uh, episode sequence following policy pi. So again with our tuples of state, action and rewards until that specific episode has terminated. Then for that specific termin uh, for that specific episode j, we will set our uh, return counter or return uh, variable to zero. <coughs> and then, uh, yeah, very important detail for uh, all <coughs> Monte Carlo uh, ideas, especially for the first versus Monte Carlo ideas, we will start from the back. So we will uh, start um, inspecting our samples at the terminal state and then go backwards until we arrive at the initial state. And uh, for each of these steps going uh, backward, we will calculate uh, in an incremental fashion 
uh, our, as we know already, our return. So our new return is our discounted old return plus the new or yeah plus the corresponding reward. And then because we don't want to do first visit MC, we have to investigate if our current so backwards going state is inside the set of states which will be in the uh, yeah newer time steps uh, looking toward the initial point so if uh, there are more visits inside the set then we will uh, skip these operations here but uh, if xk is not in the set then of course xk will be the first visit candidate of that specific episode and what we then do is two things first we will append the add return which we have calculated here to the list uh, of xk so this list is basically a list of returns for all states and then we will average about um, then we will average the returns from that list or from that updated list and update our estimate state value estimate for that specific state and that's it so very nice however of course this uh, implementation is a little bit uh, tedious because we have to uh, always carry around this very large list with us and uh, of course there is also an incremental implementation variant um, in order to reduce our memory demand and to speed up the calculation a little bit and we can do that by yeah and then recursive implementation of the uh, mean update so what is our so our mean here is mu and uh, mu at the jst episode we can just write down the basic yeah, definition is just the average uh, of all considered returns so far so we can then rearrange that uh, return definition here with that bracket here square bracket so this um, is then of course the return at e g j plus the returns from uh, the starting point until j minus one and then this again of course is our mean not taking into account the entire episode from one till j but until j minus one so we can write down this here so and then a little bit of rearranging and we have our incremental implementation so if we get a new return sample so this would be here our new return sample uh, g j we can update our mean estimate according to that last uh, equation here so this is very straightforward and with this implementation we can change the forward um, the previous implementation using lists and therefore reduce our memory demand however this uh, equation 4.2 assumes that our decision problem is <coughs> stationary so the mean uh, or our mean we are trying to estimate in terms of our state value or also a later action value is uh, constant is not changing over time and in case uh, we have a non-stationary problem so that mean we want to estimate here uh, is changing over time and then we can also a little bit modify this equation 4.2 here in particular this weighting here which is normally weighted by the number of uh, episodes considered so far just by a um, yeah, step size parameter or also sometimes called forgetting parameter alpha which is a real number between uh, 1 and 0 and uh, this will then also allow for dynamic adaption in case that the decision problem is non-stationary so then let's revisit the two different approaches we have uh, discussed now very briefly the first time visit approach so for first time visit approach we will get independent return samples of each episode because there's only one a separate return uh, sample for every episode so they are completely independent from each other and therefore in terms of our estimation task where we want to estimate our state value we can state that the data we are using to do this estimation is completely iid so perfect if we have iid and you uh, iid data and use a simple averaging uh, estimator then we know that this estimate is bias free so that's good uh, we know that over an infinite amount of samples we will get the exact um, estimate here of our state value 
and by the uh, number of large uh, by the rule of large numbers we also know that the estimates variance drops with one over n and n would be of course the number of available samples on the contrary if we are looking on every time uh, visit mc we have to uh, keep in mind that our return samples could be dependent on each other because there might be more than one sample per episode so if there are a multitude of samples per episode those estimates are linked to each other they are non iid and therefore we can we can assume or we have to face the problem that our estimate on the state value is biased so we don't get an <clears throat> exact estimate if our number of steps if our number of samples is less than infinite and only in the limit so if we really have an infinite number of samples then we can state that in this infinite the um, estimate here again will go to its true value however what i wanted to show with this slide here is that in terms of monte carlo first visit versus monte carlo every visit implementation we have a bias variance dilemma so for every visit we have a very nice feature that uh, the estimate is always bias free but as we will also see later the variance is rather large slow initial learning but very uh, precise learning let's say for a larger number of samples and on the contrary every time visit mc we have a bias for a limited number of samples but as we will also see that the learning is quicker because per episode we can obtain more samples yeah some more words on the statistical properties of monte carlo based prediction First, we don't have any uh, backup diagrams in terms of full width backups. So for dynamic programming, as we have dis discussed last week, we really take into account the full width of the MDP structure. Here for Monte Carlo, we have a very, uh, yeah, let's say, deep backup in terms of taking into account the entire episode, but it's, uh, it's not taking the entire width of the MDP structure. So that's why we can use Monte Carlo, especially also to um, estimate the state values or action values of specific states. So for dynamic programming, we really have had to estimate the state value of the entire state space in one big approach. And here in uh, Monte Carlo, we can really focus on one, two, three specific states, which we want like to anal uh, analyze. And from these specific states, we can run our episodes, do our averaging, and get estimates for these specific states. So that's very attractive if you're not interested maybe in analyzing the entire state space, but only certain specific states. And as I already mentioned, because we have this uh, full backups in terms of the depth, but uh, very shallow in terms of the width, we don't use bootstrapping here. So we don't have any correlation between estimates as we had with dynamic programming. Uh, as you may remember, their bootstrapping re uh, referred to the term estimating estimates based on other estimates. And here for uh, Monte Carlo, we have this complete independence of, of estimates, especially if you use first visit estimates. But let's apply this to uh, two examples. First example again is our forest tree MDP, as you hopefully remember from the two last lectures. And we will analyze again our 50 50 policy. So that means in every state, small, uh, uh, small size tree, medium size tree, and large size tree, we have a 50% probability of waiting uh, until the tree is growing or has grown and cutting. So getting the wood. However, there is a 20% probability that if we wait, um, there will be a disaster and the tree will be gone also independently uh, of our decision. And we will do that uh, characterization here for a discount factor of 0.8. So if you do so, we can again, um, as I've mentioned two or three slides before, focus our analysis on a specific state and as you can see here on the y-axis in this diagram we are concentrating on our initial state so the small tree state and what we see here is the mean and one standard devi deviation around the mean if we run 2000 independent trials 
on this prediction problem. So we always start in the small tree state, run independent episodes using the first wizard uh, Monte Carlo prediction, and then uh, analyze the yeah, the estimates in a second step. And as you can see here, with the number of episodes we are investing in order to predict the state value, the standard deviation reduces, so the estimates in terms of uncertainty uh, is, is getting better and better with the number of episodes here, especially for a low number of episodes, we really have a high you know, uncertainty, which is depicted here by the uh, standard deviation. Yeah, then we also have a second example here for Monte Carlo based prediction from the book of Bato and Sutton. It's a blackjack example with a slightly modified rules compared to the classical blackjack. So, but let's first summarize the problem. So, in total, we have roughly 200 states. The states can be further distinct in the player's hand. So, what cards does the player hold? We can distinguish here the the values in terms of 12 to 21 assuming that if the player has less than 12 uh, uh, the player will automatically twist twist means so he will get more cards then we have a binary state so if it counts one then we call it a usable ace and if it calls 11 then call it a non-usable ace and on the other side we have the dealer's initial card, so our opponent uh, will also have one card on uh, the deck, which will be vis visible to us or to our agent. And if we sum up all the different um, possible combinations here, we can roughly uh, summarize 200 states. And what actions do we have in Blackjack? Basically two. The first one is stick. Stick means we want uh, to stop receiving cards. And then this um, term, we're also then terminating the episode. So that means we are finished with our actions and the dealer can uh, do his or her move. And then the episode will be uh, evaluated who has more points. Um, and then a the reward will be given. And the reward for stick is, of course, we get a positive uh, reward of uh, plus one. If at the end of the episode we have the higher amount of uh, sum on our hands, if we have a drawer, so both have the uh, same number of cards, uh, points on his hands, then we have a zero reward. And if we lost, so the dealer has a better end card, then we, then, uh, yeah, we get a minus negative reward. Second action is a so-called twist or hit, so we will take another card and also in the terms of uh, Bato and Sutton uh, blackjack rules we assume that there are no replacements in the cards. And here the rewards are either yeah, the bad case, we go bust, so we have received a card which will push our total cards sum to greater than 21 and in this case in blackjack we consider uh, that a loss and yeah we will get a direct reward then of minus one and if we receive any other card which will give us a total sum of less than 21 then yeah we are still alive so uh, nothing really changed uh, so to speak and we get a reward of zero and can again uh, in the next action either uh, make another twist or stick in the simplified example here from uh, Bato and Sutton it is assumed that the dealer so our opponent always sticks if he or she has a sum greater or equal to 17. And then we can use Monte Carlo first visits in order to predict the state values or of course a certain policy and that certain policy is depicted here again strongly simplified so the player so our agent is only sticking so doesn't receive any further cards if the sum on his hand is 20 or 21. So he really wants to get close to the jackpot here of 21. Of course, this is then also um, also linked to the high probability. If you have 19, 18, 17 or something on your hands and you get an additional card bringing your sum to greater than 21 that you will bust. And with uh, then uh, 10,000 episodes and 500,000 episodes which are used in order to evaluate Monte Carlo, um, first visit estimates we can see here the yeah, state value map so to say which is separated in these two binary distinctions either we have a usable ace on the hand or we don't have a usable ace on the hand 
and here on the yeah let's call it uh, y-axis we have the amount of uh, some or the sum amount of the opponent of the dealer and here on the x-axis we have the player sum and yeah so we can see if we have uh, uh, no usable ace after 10,000 episodes the state value map uh, already looks quite smooth we don't see the biggest change um, when we compare that to 490,000 more episodes being evaluated up to 500,000 episodes however in the case of a usable ace uh, on our hand that uh, state value map at 10,000 episodes being evaluated are somehow shaky, um, not very smooth, a lot of uncertainty probably inside the estimates. So here we really need that additional episodes in order to get a smooth uh, overall knowledge of the state space. And we will also use that blackjack example in a second um, trial today uh, for model based, uh, for Monte Carlo based control. So up to now we have used Monte Carlo prediction again only for state value state value prediction so what is about action values so how can we get the action values and there we can distinguish first is a model available so for example we we may didn't want to use a model um, because the model itself is maybe too complex to evaluate it a lot in terms of dynamic programming but maybe once in a while we can use it to predict uh, one step ahead in terms of having state values at hand and then use one step ahead prediction and that could deliver us of course an optimal policy and if uh, the action values uh, if the model is not available then of course we um, have the the problem okay how do we do that uh, one step ahead prediction um, now so that's not possible anymore so we really have to get an estimate on the action values directly in order to obtain optimal choices and we can do that also using monte carlo approach directly estimating q our action values in the same way as we have discussed in the previous algorithm first with the monte carlo approach and the only extension we have to make we don't discuss it in detail because it's very straightforward is that we don't take into account only the state but the state action pairs so the first and every visit uh, mc variants exist for both cases here state value as well as action value estimates yeah there might be a problem uh, if we are operating in a deterministic with a deterministic policy because in this case it might occur that certain state action pairs are never visited so we have a problem here with exploration because we cannot probe the entire state in action space and an workaround which can be used here which we'll also use for monte carlo control later is the so-called exploring starts so exploring starts assume that we can initialize our environment in random state action pair combinations and with these uh, exploring starts we can then ensure that all state action pairs are visited in a yeah, certain amount or with a high probability and then um, following a certain policy pi we have enough exploration in order to estimate the state value also the action value uh, of the entire action state space so that is a yeah simple let's say more academic workaround okay so we know now how to apply our monte carlo methods in order to do prediction but how um, do we use it for control so to find an optimal policy and here you may remember the idea of generalized policy iteration GPI which we also used in dynamic programming and the main idea is summarized here in equation 4.4 or here also in figure 4.6 basically we have an iterative sequence of having a certain policy evaluating that policy getting an estimate for that policy here in terms of an action value and then based on that estimate we are trying to improve our policy by greedy choices and so on and so on and on um, doing that a couple of times we are approaching optimal policy pi star of course when we do that with Monte Carlo so we can directly apply GPI together with Monte Carlo 
Then we have a new degree of freedom, which we didn't have really with uh, dynamic programming. And this is the number of episodes we want to invest to approximate the action value at a certain uh, GPI iteration. So here we can invest more or less episodes and therefore our, let's say, the quality and the uncertainty of that estimate will be uh, higher or smaller. And then, as I said, the policy improvement um, here in these policy improvement steps are then again done by greedy choices. So we, in, we inspect the entire state space of our MDP problem and make these choices which will maximize the action values in the different states. It is um, important to yeah, note that the policy improvement theory, which we have discussed last time for uh, dynamic programming, also applies one-to-one -one here to the Monte Carlo-based uh, control framework because we are still operating in an MDP, so the problem structure is still the same compared to dynamic programming. The only difference is now that we don't know the MDP structure beforehand, so we don't have a full model. But as, a pro as the underlying problem is well known and um, as Monte Carlo will, methods will then learn about these internal dynamics of the problem, we can reuse and restate the policy improvement theory and therefore um, can state that Monte Carlo control using GPI will also find an optimal policy in an MDP environment. Of course, the only assumption or the only requirement we have to apply and fulfill is that all state action pairs are evaluated um, enough uh, in, in, in an in-depth manner in su sufficiently often in order to um, have a full exploration of the state and action space. And uh, here, as we also used exploring starts, for the prediction purpose, we can do it here also in the control context. So we will initialize our agent in random state action combinations and then from that point on apply GPI to find an optimal policy. How is Monte Carlo based control looking like when we use that exploring starts in a first visit variant? So output, of course, as we are doing control, is optimal policy, P star. Our initialization could be arbitrary for any um, state. Also, we need some initialization of the action values because we are here operating again in a value-based fashion and we will need an empty list uh, again in order to count the number of state action visits for uh, the incremental implementation of the updates and this list is here called n. We could also work with a constant update factor as I've mentioned before, so with a constant alpha or something, then we don't need this list. However, so what we do again is we repeat over a couple of episodes and um, in, in any episode we choose some random state and action starting point such that all state action pairs have this probability greater than zero. So we really ensure that we will start in each and every state action um, combination which is available in the state action state space, in the state action space. And then we will follow a certain policy pi until that episode is terminated. We again set our return counter here to zero and then um, in the same way as we did it with Monte Carlo prediction, we start at the latest, so at the terminal time step and then move forward until we reach the initial time step. For each of these steps inside one episode, we update our return. So we take the old return discounted plus the new reward. And then, as I said, we are doing here first visit Monte Carlo approach. We probe, we try to find out if that certain uh, time step we are looking in is a first visit uh, Monte Carlo uh, visit or not. If it is a first visit, then we will uh, increment our counter. So n again was our list of the number of visits for that state action pair. So we increment it by one and then we apply our well-known action value incremental implementation here with that list of n and as I said we could also alternatively 
exchange this here with a constant learning factor or constant forgetting factor alpha, then we don't need that list. So that would be a variant. And after we have updated the action value, so um, after a full episode, then we can do a greedy choice around uh, about uh, the state action values and then update our policy. So here again, we can state that the action value update as well as the policy update can be only performed when a full episode has been performed. And for example, we could use a Monte Carlo based control in order to find an optimal blackjack policy in that simplified way or in the simplified environment as shown before. And as we can see here, we get uh, slightly improved state values compared to that uh, policy where we where we sticked uh, until the uh, player sum was 20 or 21. And now we can see we have a distinct different policy depending if we have a usable ace on our hand or not. And we get, let's say, yeah, a matrix or a combinatorial combination of the player sum and the dealer showing uh, some on his hands in order to get new cards or to stick to our current hand cards. So basically if we have already a high sum on our hand uh, the likelihood of sticking is larger and yeah, if we have a rather small uh, hand number then we want to get a new card and then there is a difference between having usable ace or having a non-usable ace. This was, let's say, the first basic Monte Carlo based uh, control idea using exploring starts. But um, yeah, we will extend this also to some more, let's say, application oriented, to some more realistic control approach in the section. So, first, uh, I want to discuss the difference on on policy learning. So, on policy learning is pretty much what we have done until now. So we will evaluate and improve our policy um, on, uh, let's say, one basis. So there's only that one policy which is evaluated and then improved over time. And for Monte Carlo, we have to use exploring starts in order to ensure a sufficient level of exploration. However, uh, these exploring starts are, of course, very restrictive assumption. So, and in many applications, we may not have the feasibility, we don't have the option to freely choose the starting state action pair. So this is an academic assumption in order to ensure the uh, exploration, but it's not applicable in all situations. So how we can compensate that is either so-called off-policy learning. So we will have two policies, one so-called behavior policy, which is designed for exploring the state action space, and we will have a target policy, which will become then the optimal policy. And in this case, we have yeah, divided, we have split up that exploration exploitation dilemma a little bit. However, we will focus on the off policy methods in the second part of this today lecture. And in this section, we will try to modify an on policy learning approach such that we can get rid of that exploring start assumption. And this idea is called Epsilon Greedy. So Epsilon Greedy is an alternative for on policy learning. And we will have an exploration or our general exploration requirement. We have also yeah. stated or slightly discussed last week with dynamic programming is that we really have to visit all state action combinations in the state action state space in order to yeah, get information what uh, state action combinations are the best, so what policy is the best to solve that MDP with optimal performance. And we call any policy which is able to provide us this feature so that we will have a probability greater than zero um, of all actions in a given state as soft. And the so-called epsilon greedy policy is a yeah, very typical example of such an soft policy, it's not the only one, but it's, let's say, the most um, known one. And uh, basically, epsilon, this yeah, constant parameter, or this design parameter, 
is a probability factor which refers to the case that with probability epsilon the agent is overwriting the policy output with a random action so we basically throw a coin and uh, or not a coin but we throw a random generator on and then uh, we look if with probability epsilon we will stick to our yeah, policy which is active or we will do a random move so therefore we can state that the probability of all non-greedy actions is epsilon over that um, u or that set of u and so that u is also called the cardinality of the action space so how many possible actions are in the action space and then the so of course if all non-greedy actions have this uh, probability then we can state that the greedy action has a probability of 1 minus epsilon plus epsilon divided by so that would be then the idea of applying epsilon greedy learning to yeah, add in some random choices uh, although we are following only one policy how is the implementation of epsilon greedy it is pretty much similar to the exploring start monte carlo control with some slight changes and i will also i will only focus on the slight changes so again the output is we want to have an optimal policy but we now call it an optimal epsilon greedy policy we will discuss also on the next two slides why are uh, yeah, this is an important uh, remark here and so the we get an hyperparameter of that uh, approach here which is epsilon so our degree of how much we want to explore the initialization is the same again monte carlo we are getting full episodes we update our returns and then uh, this is like uh, the new idea that um, if we make an update so if we have the first visit um, condition met and we make an update of our action value and of our um, policy here that we will then throw in that epsilon greedy idea so we will um, define policy pi always in an stochastic way uh, as we have discussed on the previous slide that with probability uh, 1 minus epsilon plus epsilon over u we will pick our best possible action so the best possible action is here denoted as u tilde and we also have the non greedy choices with probability epsilon over the cardinality of the action space so basically pretty similar to the standard first visit monte carlo approach however now with this special update of our stochastic policy we ensure that we have full exploration on the state space and therefore a soft policy what consequences follow out of epsilon greedy on policy control the first consequence is that the policy improvement theorem still applies but slightly different in such a way that we now compare two epsilon greedy policies against each other so with the let's say classical policy improvement theory we had full greedy policies or in general speaking policies compared to policies and now we compare epsilon uh, we compare pi uh, versus p prime and assume that both are epsilon greedy policies and in this case the policy improvement theory still holds we can also prove that we start here again just by writing out the action values following policy pi in state x and then this new action u here is Due to a new policy p prime and we can just write that out so the weighted sum of the yeah, old action values and plugging in that new policy p prime for the action and then this can be separated into two terms the first term is uh, the sum here so this is uh, would be the sum over all the non-greedy actions and then here that one minus epsilon and the max over the action values would be then that um, action which is taking greedily we can then uh, access so we can evaluate this function against uh, this one here um, in this inequality so the first part here is the same or the first term is the same so these two 
no change and what we only have to compare is um, the second one with the max operator compared to that sum here and we can state okay um, okay here we take the max for a specific state regarding the action of the action values and here this is only the weighted sum of something so taking the max of something compared to this weighted sum of something so this here the first line will be always greater than the second line and on the next slide we will see uh, where this uh, change or where this uh, rewriting will lead us to so here on this continuation so the first equation here the first line of the equation is just the repetition from the former slide so here uh, the first term would be again our uh, weighted sum in terms of the non-greedy actions and this uh, here on the left hand side we just have rewritten and then what we do is we evaluate this parenthesis here so uh, that one uh, together with uh, this uh, term here epsilon over u and the action value can be combined with that first uh, term here and what remains is a sum over the uh, old policy and the action value and so what we can see from the tree arrangement is that this is cancelling out each other so we have uh, the action value minus the action value so that is zero and here so this is basically the definition of our yeah state value right so this is just weighting all action values with our current policy prime not with the new policy but with our current policy prime over actions and this is then pretty much the state value and then if we compare this to each other we perfectly have proven the epsilon greedy policy improvement theorem when we assume that we compare two epsilon greedy policies against each other so what does that um, bring what is the take a, a takeaway method here so the policy improvement still uh, is valid however we are only comparing epsilon greedy policies against other epsilon greedy policies so there might be and with high probability there will be also a non epsilon greedy policy which is better so we have here a severe drawback so on the one hand we have that uh, nice idea of epsilon greedy that we have a, a full exploration of the state action space but on the other side we have to buy this advantage at the disadvantage of having to take non-greedy actions so they we, we may lose some part of our optimality on the track so this is a, is a severe drawback here of epsilon greedy policy that we are always yeah lose something so we have or we have to invest a little bit of exploitation in order to receive that exploration feature and if we apply uh, epsilon greedy control to our forest tree mdp again for a disaster probability of 20 percent a discount rate of 0.80 and we uh, want to use epsilon greedy control with an epsilon factor of 0.2 we can see here three things these are the action values for first state second state third state always for the waiting action so that's u equals w then we get the, the policy so we have an epsilon greedy policy um so this is a probability of uh, waiting in the first state waiting in the second state waiting in the third state I didn't depict it here in that figure also the uh, other actions so the the cutting actions because yeah we just have two actions so it is uh, just yeah not the opposite but you can easily um calculate what will be then the the action value or the policy uh, probability for the cutting action and here on the last row we get the number of visits on how often we have visited using epsilon greedy monte carlo control that uh, state action pair and what we can see here is that we have uh, i believe two very uh, interesting takeaway messages the first one is that the later states so state three which is uh, yeah just the the big tree state is less often visited compared to the previous state so the initial state of course is most often visited compared or this state action combination is most often visited compared to this or this state action 
combination and therefore also the later state action combinations have a higher uncertainty so again here this blue um, light blue background color is one standard devi deviation around the mean so with epsilon uh, monte carlo control we get let's say more certain policies and more certain estimates here also on the action values for the initial or for the early state action combinations and receive a higher uncertainty for the later state action combinations also you can see that the uh, here that policy is giving us only the epsilon greedy best policy as i said the maximum or the uh, epsilon factor was 20 percent so as you remember for these combinations or for this configuration of of the mdp forestry mdp the best policy would be to wait to cut to cut but due to uh, epsilon greedy we see we cannot reach that yeah certainty of really waiting in the first state or cutting in the second state we only get it here with 80 percent and here roughly with 20 percent which perfectly uh, corresponds to that epsilon greedy factor here of 20 percent and here even for the third state and then waiting we see that we still need some more uh, episodes so i've just calculated this here for 500 episodes that we are in steady state so this is a severe drawback for uh, applying epsilon greedy policy if you do the same uh, same setup the only thing which have changed is epsilon greedy is now not 20% uh, but 5% and as we can see uh, that the uncertainty for all state action combinations is higher so these blue areas here have increased a lot but we can see that in the long run so it's a little bit hard to see but we can see that in the long run that our optimal decisions are closer or that our decisions become closer to the real optimum decisions so here we are come very close to one here yeah if we spend maybe some more episodes we come really close to uh, zero so to uh, not to wait in the second state but to cut and such things so we have this uh, trade-off again here of applying high epsilon greedy values in order uh, to ensure fast exploration fast learning and small epsilon greedy values in order to find really the optimal values in the long run so if you sum that up what are the interesting observations for the forestry mdp applying epsilon greedy um, control we have shown that there's a rather slow convergence so we really have to apply quite a number of episodes and especially for the later state actions combinations large tree states especially uh, the uncertainty stays very high and yeah so this is basically also same here that we have a significant uncertainty present in, in in every single sequence and therefore also in every single state action combination the later states are less often visited and therefore more uncertain and yeah the exploration can be clearly controlled by epsilon so uh, if we uh, apply a large uh, epsilon greedy value then the likelihood of visiting all state action combination is increased and vice versa and uh, however we could show that the color control here with epsilon greedy goes into the right direction so the trend is your friend uh, it is uh, converging towards an optimal policy and we will look next what we could maybe do to use epsilon greedy control to really find the optimal policy in the long run and here the idea is to look for a so-called glee implementation of epsilon greedy and glee stands for greedy in the limit with infinite exploration so uh, what does that mean so it basically two important aspects we have to combine so we have a learning policy and we call that learning policy glee so greedy in the limit with infinite exploration if the policy satisfies two properties the first property is that if a state is infinitely often visited then also the action or each action of that state has to be chosen infinitely often so let's say in the uh, limit the probability of taking all actions must be one so really just having let's say a complete huge data set of all state actions combinations and also second property in the limit um, we will or we have to ensure that the learning uh, policy is greedy with respect to the learned action values and how can we do that with epsilon 
greedy approach, we can do that by yeah, more or less discounting or not discounting, but adaptively uh, changing our epsilon greedy value. And one can show that if we adapt our epsilon greedy factor here by one over the number or over the current number of episodes, so i is the current number of episodes we are evaluating, then uh, we can show that um, epsilon greedy Monte Carlo control with that adapted uh, epsilon greedy value is glee. So if we would theoretically run an infinite number of episodes starting from an epsilon greedy soft policy, then with that adaption rule we can show that in the limit the resulting policy pi is optimal. However, so this is more or less an academic outlook I would say, an academic remark, because it's yeah, not really feasible to run any problem in an infinite number of episodes. And therefore, the uh, yeah feasibility or that proof in terms of of practical applicability is limited. We only get like here an, a takeaway message, of course, is to play around with the exploration factor, right? So at the beginning, when we start to operate our agent in an unknown environment, it's maybe wise to start with rather high epsilon greedy values in order to focus on exploration, and then in the long run to decrease it and decrease it even more in order to go for exploitation based on our available knowledge. So this is maybe the takeaway message which we can get here from Glee in terms of Monte Carlo control. And however we will also discuss that uh, not today but uh, a little bit today but especially also in the next couple of lectures. So Epsilon Greedy of course it's a completely undirected exploration strategy. So we just take any kind of a non-greedy action in a random fashion but uh, it's uh, still um, random action, it's completely undirected. And the question is, is that kind of learning the most efficient way? And we uh, have to discuss that, of course, then during this course. So with that, we uh, will leave behind on policy prediction and control. So we had one policy pi which we either wanted to evaluate in terms of prediction, so what are the state values and the action values of that policy, or we wanted to improve it, either using exploring starts and greedy choices, or epsilon greedy control in terms of yeah, um, exploitation, exploration trade-off. And now we want to extend this idea to so-called off-policy solutions, uh, first starting with prediction and then also transferring it to control. So the background again is, as we have discussed with Epsilon Greedy, that uh, this is only in compromise. So we always have this um, yeah, exploration, exploitation dilemma. And for any Epsilon factor greater than zero, we only have a near optimal policy. We don't have the full optimal policy. And the idea of off-policy learning is now to split a policy or to use two separated policy. One is the so-called behavior policy, uh, denoted as B, which is uh, used in order to explore the state action space and to generate rich experience. And we use then um, the target policy, Pi, which will learn from that experience to become, in the long run, the optimal policy without any regret, without, any, yeah, w without having any uh, non-optimal choices in there. And this off-policy idea can be applied to some use cases, for example, uh, if uh, we are doing some tasks where also humans can uh, act as a teacher, then maybe an agent or controller can learn from these uh, human observations. We can reuse old uh, policy uh, experiences, trying to learn something out of a memory, and of course we can uh, learn about a multitude of policies. So this um, and this idea here of having one behavior policy and one target policy, of course, can be also extended. So we could try to uh, have one exploration policy B, behavior policy B, and we're trying to uh, also estimate then um, a multitude of target policies. So that could be also possible. So let's restate the Monte Carlo off policy prediction problem. So we want to estimate the state value V of a policy pi or its action. Uh, value counterpart. However, we don't follow policy pi, but we follow a behavior policy 
B. And for prediction purpose, we assume that both policies are fixed during the evaluation. To do so, we have to introduce some requirements. The first requirement is so-called coverage. So we have to require, we have to assume that every possible action taken under policy pi, which uh, should be evaluated and of policy style, must be at least occasionally taken also under that behavior policy B. So this is more or less straightforward. So if we have a, for example, stochastic policy pi, for every state action combination where the probability is greater than zero, then this also has to apply to the policy uh, behavior policy B. So this is more or less, uh, I believe, straightforward, very intuitive. We need data uh, in the state action space, which is relevant for our target policy pi. So the consequences from that is that uh, in any state uh, B is not identical to uh, to pi, then B must be stochastic. So for example, in an uh, greedy epsilon greedy sense, and uh, if pi is uh, deterministic, then uh, yeah, or pi itself could be deterministic or also stochastic. So uh, pi as our target policy can be flexible, but in general, it's always a very good idea to have a stochastic policy B in order to do exploration. And now the question is, how can we map it? So we will get experience from uh, the behavior policy B and we want to estimate Q or V on policy pi. And how can we map these experiences from an alien policy to our target policy pi? And we can do that by the so-called important sampling idea. So the question is, what is the probability of serving a certain trajectory on random variables. So again, here are a sequence of random actions and random states, starting in a certain state and then terminating at xt, following policy pi. And this is yeah, more or less stated here. So we have as boundary condition giving our starting state and policy pi. And what is the probability to, to specifically observe this sequence here? And we can state that this is the multiplication of the policy being in state x, applying action u, and then the probability, of course, applying this action being in state x and then transitioning into state x k plus one and so on. So we more or less have a chain of transition probabilities and policies, which is basically stated also here. So we have a multiplication of our policy probability times our transition probability with respect to these state action combination. And we can apply this equation 4.17 now for the two policies. So for our target policy as well as for our behavior policy. And this is called then the importance sampling ratio. So this is the relative probability of a trajectory under the target policy and behavior policy. So how uh, big is uh, the likelihood of observing the one trajectory following the behavior policy and then mapping it to the target policy. Or we denote that important sampling ratio here by that uh, variable rho. And this index here, k to uh, capital T, is denoting then the episodes we are uh, taking into account starting at sampling step k until termination t. And if we just apply equation 4.17 for the target policy and for the behavior policy, we can see that these transition probabilities canceling out each other because the transition probabilities are part of the MDP. And the MDP structure, of course, is the same. So if I'm operating behavior policy or target policy inside the MDP, it's the same. It's, of course, unknown, but uh, as I said, the environment, of course, is given. So we can cancel out that. And the only thing which is remaining in terms of that important sampling ratio is then the uh, multiplication of the, um, of the target probability and the behavior probability. And this is then called the important sampling ratio rho. And we can now apply the importance sampling, also called an ordinary importance sampling, to map to transfer the returns G, which we gather using that behavior policy B 
and map, the, map them using importance sampling ratios row to our target policy pi. And as we do that over a multitude of episodes, again, we are averaging. So this denominator here is the averaging um, by the set of time steps in which the state xk is either visited for the first time if we do first visit mc implementation or each time if we do every visit mc calculus. So basically pretty much the same as we had for normal on policy uh, MC prediction, but now we have to do that mapping, that transfer from our sampled returns from behavior policy to target policy. So some remarks. Um, the nice thing is, as we yeah, have discussed the important sampling on the previous slide, this mapping is, is perfectly doing fine. So we don't have any assumption here or something like that. We can really... A state then this um, that this mapping is bias free so um, applying this transfer here is a bias free estimate then again of the target policy state value however depending on how many samples we map here on how ma many samples we transfer here the um, estimates variance might be rather large because basically row or the different rows for the different episodes uh, are somehow scaling our returns and this scaling can be um, yeah, considered as some type of variance and therefore or if the uh, if the relation between the behavior policy and the target policy is untypical then uh, the uh, row becomes maybe uh, very large and therefore that uh, estimate is also yeah um, very uncertain in the first sampling so, so this is a large drawback of the ordinary important sampling because its variance uh, of that mapping is rather large or can be rather large and therefore we want to also have a view on a second variant on importance sampling which is called the weighted importance sampling or short WIS. So basically more or less the same idea we are also averaging our sampled returns from the behavior policy and map it to the target policy by the uh, importance sampling ratios row however now in the denominator we don't just do simple averaging so we don't take into account the number of uh, time steps the number of episodes uh, which are relevant for that mapping but we normalize this mapping by again the sum of these uh, sampling ratios and by this normalization we of course introduce some bias so this scaling is not bias free however it can be shown that in the limit so again if we apply a lot of uh, episodes here a lot of samplings and uh, this will vanish but in general for only a few a limited number of of episodes this will be biased and the nice thing so this was a drawback but the advantage is that due to that normalization we really ensure that the variance here which we introduce by that scaling is limited so it's uh, it's bounded now it's not unbounded as it was in the ordinary important sampling case and therefore the variance of that mapping from our sampled returns uh, from the behavior policy to the target policy is drastically reduced and therefore if you have a limited number of samples it is very likely that this um, estimate here will perform better compared to the ordinary important sampling. So again we have this bias variance dilemma here which we can either attack by OES or WIS. However in practice, uh, it can be shown, and we will also look at a, um, an example on the next slide, that the weighted important sampling does better at estimates for fewer samples and therefore is preferred in the practice. And we can uh, have a look on this um, by the blackjack example again. And we just uh, want to estimate uh, one certain state, and we do that for a behavior policy which is just yeah like a 50-50 policy so we stick or hit at equal probability independent of its uh, yeah, specific state. The target policy is yeah as we all more or less already discussed the player sticks if he has a sum of 20 or 21 otherwise he hits and uh, if we want to uh, evaluate the state value of uh, this uh, policy it would be minus 0.2733 and we can do that either by important sampling or by the weighted important sampling. And here on the x-axis in log scale, we get the number of episodes which we take into account for this specific uh, state value estimation.
Here on the y-axis, we then have a metric and um, performance metric in order to evaluate the mean square error on uh, the estimate um, of policy estimate by weighted important sampling and ordinary important sampling compared to that true value. And as we can see here, roughly up to 100 episodes which we invest, the weighted important sampling is much better. And then following, yeah, maybe after 500 or something, Oh, and not 500, but 200 because it's log scale episodes and maybe it's it's even. And then if we would zoom in, so like here, really uh, zoom in into this area, we would see that really in the long run, the OES is a little bit better compared to the WIS. However, for let's say real uh, for a realistic number of episodes, for a rather small number of episodes, the weighted important sampling, although it's biased, but its variance is reduced, is just performing better and this is yeah something uh, which can be observed uh, very often in practice that if the number of episodes if the number of samples is few we are tending to estimate uh, we are tending to estimate us which rather give us a better variance behavior compared to our biased or uh, unbiased estimators However, uh, also as we have discussed in the on policy case, an incremental implementation would be beneficial. We can do that for uh, the OES uh, right away just by applying the uh, incremental implementation we have discussed at the beginning of the today's lecture. For the uh, weighted important sampling, we need to um, yeah dig a little bit deeper. Um, but also here the goal of course is desirable in order to save memory and computational resources. We can therefore just rewrite the uh, yeah, um, weighted important sampling uh, sequence again just by short notation that W is now the uh, important sampling ratio rho. Uh, however, then uh, equation 4.21 is just the WAS uh, regulation we have discussed so far. And then with some intermediate steps, which I don't show here in detail, but just the, uh, the uh, result, then the recursive or incremental update rule would be as follows. So the new update at episode or at sampling uh, update i plus 1 of the state value x is the old one plus w i divided by c i times the new sampled return minus the old state value for, um, yeah, just starting at the first episode of first update and then ci is our cumulative sum of weights of the previous um, updates and therefore ci plus one is just ci plus wi plus one and we start with c zero equals zero so this is the uh, incremental implementation of the uh, weighted impl uh, of the weighted importance sampling and we can use the weighted important sampling here for Monte Carlo based off policy prediction and we directly apply it to the action value estimation because then we can slightly modify this algorithm later for the control purpose and also have an off policy Monte Carlo control algorithm. However, in the prediction task we want to evaluate our target policy pi and uh, yeah we need to initialize of course our action values arbitrarily and uh, as we have discussed with the incremental implementation we need a list of cumulative sum of weights which we denote here as c for every state action uh, combination and then for any episode we use a soft policy or at least a policy with coverage of pi so our behavior policy b we generate episodes following that policy and for every at the beginning of the evaluation of every episode we set our return variable to zero and uh, w here is our yeah importance weight in important sampling weight to one and then again as we did all the time for monte carlo we do the evaluation per episode from the termination step towards the initialization step we calculate the return uh, in this way then we update the cumulative weight list for a given uh, state action combination. Then with that update, we uh, again update the action value for that specific state action combination by this weighting factor here, W divided, uh, um, divided by the sum of uh, prior weights. And then in the last step of the increment incremental WIS implementation, we update our weighting factor 
by uh, the multiplication of the old weighting factor times that important sampling ratio for that specific uh, state action combination regarding the target policy and the behavior policy. And we can apply then the off policy prediction using weighting important sampling for the forestry MDP again. For example, we could use a 50 50 policy for the uh, behavior policy, which is perfectly a soft policy with uh, total coverage also regarding the target policy pi, which uh, should be then the optimal policy. So here, figure 2.17 was for the Markov decision process where we uh, derive the optimal policy for that MDP. Again, disaster probability factor two, uh, 0.2 and um, the discount factor is 0.8. And then we can see here again for uh, yeah, selected state action combination. So first state, second state, third state, and always the waiting action. We can see how the uh, off policy estimate is evolving. And uh, yeah, we can see the, the uh, uncertainty regarding here depicted as the standard deviation of uh, the estimates uh, based on 2000 independent runs is rather small. Again, we have this difference for the first state, which is m more often visited than the later states that the estimate is better. Um, but in general, it uh, works very well. And when we compare these uh, values here, these action values to our optimal policy found in that figure 2.7, we also find out that these uh, values here for the uh, for the optimal policy really uh, are true. So they, they uh, really work well. So now we have uh, used off policy prediction, but of course, as a last step, we also want to use off policy techniques in order to find control solutions. And basically we have everything together just to directly give us the answer to the problem because we have a Monte Carlo based control uh, using GPI. So um, a change of evaluation and improvement steps uh, in a sequential manner. And we have just learned of policy based learning uh, on the previous algorithm. So basically we can just plug in together these two steps and have an off policy Monte Carlo control algorithm. The only requirement we have is of course again just to make a recap to, to emphasize that the behavior policy we are using in order to uh, try to find the best possible uh, policy has to be a non-zero probability of selecting all actions that might be taken by the target policy. Of course the target policy is now changing over the different update episodes and therefore normally we, we just stay okay. We are on the safe side if uh, policy B is soft for example using uh, epsilon uh, greedy, at, or not epsilon greedy, but like an epsilon soft uh, style of policy. So if you do so, we are uh, having here our off policy control Monte Carlo uh, algorithm using weighted important sampling. Here again, our initialization is arbitrary in terms of the action values. We have again our cumulative sum of uh, WIS weights so that less C. And we are starting with an initial policy pi, which is the greedy uh, choices uh, with respect to our arbitrary initial uh, action values. And if there's like any tie regarding that max operator, we have to broke it. And we have to break it consistently. The same is pretty familiar for us. We do episodes with behavior policy B. We get experience or epi um, sequences of uh, rewards, actions, and states. We set our return to zero. We set our WIS weighting to one. We evaluate each sequence from the back to the beginning. We calculate our return. We update our uh, commutative sum of weights uh, information here. We update in the same way as we did for prediction purpose our action value estimate. So the only difference now in terms of, of policy control and prediction are these four lines here. So of course in control we have to update our policy, which we again do by greedy argmax over our action value estimates. We don't have here to use any epsilon greedy approach because the exploration is already incorporated by the behavior policy B. And then with that if assignment we just check if that argmax operation really did lead to any change of the policy. So if it didn't lead to any change of the policy, which would be the uh, positive if um, state, then we will break the inner loop because then um, 
uh, yeah, we, we didn't do any important sampling update step and therefore we don't want to update here our uh, weighting vector. So that's why we break our any loop if we uh, figure out that the argmax didn't uh, change something. However, if it changed something, so then the break and the exit of the inner loop doesn't occur. And then we can update again our weighting vector by the old weighting vector and one over uh, b. So this is uh, perfect. So the one here comes from the argmax. So therefore, uh, due to the argmax operator, we know uh, with the uh, policy, so uk over xk would be then the probability one. So that's why we don't have to bring in here again the probability uh, of the um, target policy pi, but we can just directly write on the one. So these four lines are then um, yeah the only modification in terms of off-policy control compared to off-policy prediction. And we can again, of course, apply that off-policy control to our uh, forest tree MDP with the same setup again. And uh, so what is shown here is a behavior policy again of 50-50. So for enough exploration in the state in action space and our initial target policy is the same. And of course, using the previous mentioned algorithm, we want to now optimize our uh, target policy here. And we have two information depicted here. Again, the action value for the yeah, three real states uh, for the weighting option and the corresponding probabilities regarding the uh, policy for 2000 independent runs. And what we can see here again is, okay, now with non-greedy, uh, with full greedy actions, we really can see, okay, for that first state, the agent figures quick, uh, quickly out that uh, waiting is very good and then here for the second state and for the third state uh, we really see that the learning takes some time so here is roughly 5000 episodes and we see that there is on the one hand a rather large uh, standard deviation so a lot of uncertainty and also the mean out of these uh, 2000 independent runs is slowly only slowly converging to that final state here of, of zero. So the y-axis is a little bit shifted in order to highlight also this uncertainty uh, regarding one standard deviation. So it takes some time, but at the end we can see that we will reach zero probability and zero probability for state three and state two, which would refer to the optimal policy, which we have uh, discussed using the uh, MDP formalism or also the dynamic programming formalism. And here now with off policy, uh, control, we can also find the same results, the same best uh, policy on a sample based fashion. So here we don't have any model, we're just operating on samples, on data we receive from the unknown environment. But of course, we really have to invest quite some episodes here. So these uh, large number of episodes comes basically from this if evaluation at the end of the of policy control algorithm because this will cut off a lot of uh, experience, a lot of samples and therefore the training is somewhat efficient because uh, it's inefficient because we are, are doing all the samples, we are uh, trying to run all these um, experiments but due to the yeah, weighted importance sampling uh, rule we cannot really take into account all episodes so we can only into take into account a uh, fraction of the experiments, uh, experience which have been gathered and therefore uh, the uh, off-policy uh, control, Monte Carlo control is somehow um, very slow in learning and also this adds of course uncertainty to the process. We will discuss in the subsequent lectures other methods which are not operating on this averaging idea, episodic averaging idea of Monte Carlo control and prediction, which can yeah, solve these issues here. But if you're interested, there are also extensions for Monte Carlo based control, which is uh, for example called precision important sampling or discounting aware important sampling if we are operating with a discount factor. And these are trying to uh, counteract these problems here in order to you know, improve the learning efficiency and also to decrease the variance of the learning. And you can find details on these two uh, extensions uh, of Monte Carlo control uh, in chapter 5.8 and 5.9 uh, 5 in the book of 
uh, Sutton and Bartu if you are interested. And with this final remark on uh, additional extensions of, uh, of Policy Monte Carlo Control, I would like to summarize the today's lecture. So you have learned that Monte Carlo is a first technique which allows us a model-free learning of value functions and optimal policies solely based on experiences gathered from uh, sampled episodes. So we don't need any model knowledge, we can just interact with the environment, we get actions, state and reward feedbacks and we can use it in order to do that prediction and control task. We use that by here yeah, deep backups, so over full episodes without any bootstrapping and Monte Carlo's main idea is to use these experiments, uh, that these experiences to uh, average returns. Uh, Monte Carlo control is again using the scheme of generalized policy iteration. So we are mixing policy evaluation and improvement in order to uh, step by step like improve our policy and also our policy evaluation in terms of uh, state and action value estimates. We have uh, also discussed quite a bit that for um, Monte Carlo based techniques where we operate on samples, we need exploration. Uh, so we really have to cover the entire state and action space. We can either do that by exploring starts, which is of course very handy, however not feasible in all applications. If we are using on policy techniques, we can do it by epsilon greedy. So we are investing a little bit of our exploitation in terms of doing random actions in every state and therefore ensure and enforce exploration. However, this uh, trade-off cannot be really uh, solved uh, easily because uh, yeah, we could of course start with a high epsilon greedy value so uh, foster the uh, exploration and then try to reduce it for a higher number of episodes and then uh, do more e exploitation kind of choices, but uh, this is not easily designed. And as an additional idea to solve this exploration exploitation dilemma we have discussed off policy le uh, learning where the agent has an additional uh, behavior policy which is soft which is uh, doing the exploration and then by uh, important sampling we can try to find an optimal policy which doesn't need to follow epsilon greedy updates and yeah the important samplings as i said transform the expectations from the behavior policy to the target policy, which can be either bias free using ordinary important sampling, but this is a very, a very slow learning which comes with high variance. And uh, we have learned that weighted important sa uh, sampling can reduce the variance, therefore increase the learning rate. But uh, there's also yeah this trade off between bias and variance, which has to be addressed when setting up such algorithms. And with this summary, again, I'm uh, pretty much done for today. I hope you have uh, learned uh, important things about our first method using sampled data in order to find optimal decisions. Uh, I thank you for your time and your kind attention and wish you a nice week.